the first idea that you have to convince yourself with is that information is equal to or proportional to variance. What does this mean? It means that the amount of information in an available data set is related to the variance of the data in that data set. It might still be ambiguous, but to convince yourself with this, imagine that you ask a simple question, how's the weather today? You got one answer saying it's uh, 16 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's a good piece of information. Imagine that you got another answer that says it's uh, 16 degrees Celsius. Then you got 10 more answers that say it's 16 degrees Celsius. The amount of information that you're getting from these additional data points is uh, negligible. It's nothing because the variance in the figure or the variance in the piece of data is uh, zero. So you, you could have just made uh, as good with one piece of information that said it's 16 degrees Celsius. But now imagine that you asked what's the weather like today, someone said it's 16 degrees Celsius. The other answer said it, uh, it felt actually a little bit cold. The third answer said uh, it was windy. The fourth answer said, no, I didn't, uh, I think I checked it, it was 18 degrees Celsius. The amount of variance in the data now tells me more information about the weather. It tells me that uh, it can be windy. It tells me that it felt actually colder than 16 degrees. Someone else said that it's actually 18 degrees as they have checked it. So it gives me a range of belief in that piece of data. And this is variability in the data that is giving us more information. So to contrast the two examples, one example is getting thousands and thousands of observations with very low variance. And another example is getting much less uh, observations with high variance and that gives us more information. So this is the first idea you have to believe to uh, understand the PCA concept, is that variance and information are proportional. The second idea is high, color, high correlation uh, is somehow less information, something that we call multicollinearity. Multicollinearity is when we have a bunch of variables and these variables are somehow related. So knowing one variable could give me uh, some indication of how the other variable will look like. So imagine the same question. Uh, today, uh, we asked what's the weather like today. Someone said it's 4 degrees Celsius. The other person said it actually felt cold. The third person said it's, uh, it was cloudy. Now, these three pieces of information are somehow correlated because we know if it's 4 degrees Celsius, it's going to be a little bit cold outside. So giving us this additional piece of information, even though it was an additional piece, but really it was correlated to the idea that the degree Celsius was 4. Uh, so we couldn't get much more information from it. Imagine that someone is telling us that uh, uh, a lot of people uh, in a certain country are very tall. Their heights range between 180 centimeters and uh, 190 centimeters. Now the other person said their weights are actually uh, are, are high as well. Knowing their weights after we know their uh, height is not as valuable if we only know their weight or only know their height because uh, height and weight are somehow correlated. You cannot have someone who is 190 centimeters tall and weighing 50. There is somehow a correlation between these two figures. So understanding this, we understand that correlated variables give less information than uncorrelated variables. So if I give you two pieces of information on two uncorrelated axes, it would give you more uh, information about whatever subject I'm discussing than giving you two pieces of information or two pieces of data on a correlated axis. So that's the second thing that you need to believe. Now, both of these ideas, the high variance, the variance and information proportionality and the correlation and less information proportionality give us an opportunity. What if we can reduce the dimensions of our data? By reducing the dimensions, we mean reducing the number of covariates or explanatory variables. So for example, in the height weight example, Instead of giving you a height and weight, what if I only give you a height? Or what if I even give you a combination of these two in one variable? So instead of giving you two different points, I can give you one point. Now imagine the savings we can do when we talk about millions of observations in big data and thousands uh, or hundreds of thousands of covariates. If we can achieve some 
reduction of the number of covariates. We can save so much on computational cost. We can save so much on uh, the data storage, and we can actually perform more analytical tools or analytical techniques on the data once we reduce its dimensions. So this is the idea of PCA. PCA wants to reduce the dimensions of the data, the number of uh, covariates of the data, by extracting information and representing it somehow in a different way. Now, to understand it better, let's look at this uh, very simple data set on a two-dimensional plot. Usually, you wouldn't do PCA on a two-dimensional uh, data, but why not? So, look at this data now. The data, this is the x, uh, these are the observations. This is the x-axis, this is the x2 axis. And every point is a representation of x1, comma x2. Now, do x1 and x2 represent most variability? What we mean here is that are they showing the most variability in the data or are they somehow, can we find axes that are somehow describing the variability more? And remember, variability equals information. And are X1 and X2 correlated? So if they are correlated, maybe giving uh, one information or one uh, covariate could do. Or maybe given a combination of these two would do. Why give them both? So we can see clearly that there is some correlation when X is increasing, X2 is increasing as well. So it gives us an indication that we can do something about this. We can achieve some dimensionality reduction. The idea of PCA is to look for the dimension that has the most variability. So it is, uh, imagine that the variability is proportional to the range. So in the first data set, it was uh, this, the range of X1 was from here to here, and the range of X2 was from here to here. Now, when I do this, I'm increasing the range of my axis. So now X1 uh, star has a bigger range. X2 star has a smaller range. But what did we gain? We gained that X2 and X1 are completely orthogonal in terms of the data distribution. So now there is no correlation between X1 and X2. Because if you notice, x1 here has uh, x1 star here has two observations. x1 star here has almost two or three observations in the same point. So it tells us that the correlation is very low to none. And if you remember, uh, the uh, non-correlated axes give us more information. And orthogonality, orthogonality in terms of the data distribution, when we have a change in one variable is not uh, causing a change in the other variable, is uncorrelation. So this is the idea of PCA. We fitted a new uh, axis, and that axis captured most of the variability in the data. Now, if we just uh, remove the old axis, project the data, the same data on the new uh, on the new x1 star, x2 star, and we look at it differently, we will see that these are basically the principal components. So uh, PC1 and PC2 are the same. Uh, axis that we fitted that captured most of the variability in the data. We can see that always PC1 will have more variability than PC2 and PC2 if we have three dimensions will have more variability than PC3. So the principal components one additional uh, benefit of them is that they are ranked from the one with the most variability to the one with the lowest variability. This means that we can somehow capture an amount of variability that we are interested in, let's say 80% or 90%, by capturing the first few principal components. So here we can see that the range of uh, PC2 is much smaller. Maybe we can do just with PC1. It's a, a choice that we can do as statisticians or data analysts. Now, this is the idea of uh, P, uh, principal component analysis. In summary, what we did and now I'm giving you the, word, the terminology. It might be a little confusing, but we will make it very simple. PCA is a linear. It's linear. We worked with linear data. Dimensionality reduction method that finds new uncorrelated linear combination of original variables. So what is an uncorrelated linear combination of original variables? It's basically new axes. Because an axis, uh, once you have two new axes, you're making a new linear combination of x1 and x2. Uh, and this is basically the idea of uncorrelated linear combination of original variables. Let's represent the most variability, and variability, remember, is information in the data. 
So are we getting more information by this transformation? No, we're not. But what we are doing is that we are separating the information, some on PC1 and some on PC2. And the idea is that then we can decide if one PC is enough, if two PCs are enough, or three PCs are enough, because we are capturing the information on every axis separately. Now the procedure of the method. The procedure of the method is basically really two steps. The first step is to find the principal component, which is the linear combination of the original variables with maximum variance, however subject to a normalizing constraint, uh, because we're interested in the direction uh, of that axis, we're not as interested in the uh, length of the axis or the magnitude. So uh, the linear combination basically, let's say uh, for the first observation or for the first axis is A1, uh, is the vector of the linear combination, it has to have a magnitude of 1. So basically to calculate this, it's the eigenvector associated with the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix of the data. The jth PC, which is the second, the third, the fourth, have the same exact way, except that instead of finding the uh, most variability, we'll find the jth most variability, uh, because as we mentioned, PC2 have less variability than PC1. However, it has to be uh, uncorrelated, where the covariance of one uh, vector of linear combination to the other equal zero. So it means that they have to be orthogonal and the data has to be distributed in them independently. By doing this, we are separating the information. So with some information on the first PC, some information on the second, some information on the third. Now we might be saying, what? I didn't get that. It's a lot of eigenvector, eigenvalues, uh, linear combinations. And I'm, uh, so let's make it a little bit more intuitive. So what are we doing exactly? Why are we even talking about covariance matrices? We remember these crazy things that have variance and covariance of different variables that put in a matrix. But why are we even bringing this up? So remember, the idea is that we want to uh, find uh, axes that uh, do not have correlation to each other. So it gives us an intuition that correlation is brought into the uh, topic. So by having this covariance matrix, it's, uh, the covariance matrix is going to capture the covariance of every variable to the other variable. So what we are trying to do is uh, get this matrix and then start to find different things about this matrix that can make us separate the uh, correlation between the two variables. So because we are trying to find new directions that do not have correlation to each other, so correlation A and B, let's say the axes are A and B, equals zero, it means that somehow, some way, the covariance of A and B also should be zero. So let's start with a matrix that contains all the information we need. And this is why we bring up the covariance matrix. Now, why are we talking about eigenvalues and eigenvectors? You might remember this from a, a linear algebra course or some matrix algebra. And I don't know if you liked it, but maybe you didn't. So why do we care about eigen things? So since we care about the variability in the data in different directions, finding the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix capture the variability of data in an orthogonal basis. So the idea of the eigenvectors or eigenvalues uh, intuitively, without uh, the mathematical terminology, is that it finds uh, kind of separate uh, variations within the matrix. So it finds the directions the matrix is going with, such that when we multiply uh, the eigenvector by a scalar, it can give us the uh, original uh, uh, eigenvector of the original matrix just scaled, so it doesn't change direction. So don't worry about this. What you need to understand is that when I do some eigen decomposition, I'm finding the directions that are not correlated within the matrix. That will not change uh, when I multiply them by a certain scalar. So this is where the eigenvalues and eigenvectors came. Uh, remember, we're doing them for the covariance matrix, which are trying to find the directions that are uncorrelated within the data. So now you might be thinking, we talked about correlation and covariance. Correlation and covariance are almost the same thing. One is standardized and one is not standardized. Actually, if you look up their formulas, uh, the correlation uses the covariance within its uh, formula. So it's just standardizing the covariance. So can we do PCA on correlation? The, the answer is yes, we can. And sometimes we have to use the correlation, sometimes we might 
prefer to use the covariance. When do we do uh, each of these? This is one of the practical considerations. So if the original data had different uh, scales, or they were recorded on different units of measure, so some, let's say that some of my data was about uh, uh, degrees Celsius, that will range probably from uh, minus uh, something to probably plus 40 or plus 50, depending on where you are in the world. And we talked about something like the uh, wind speed, which would have probably a higher range. Uh, the data will have a different effect on the PCA because we are trying to find some uh, linear combinations. So the linear combinations might be biased towards the uh, data with more variance or more magnitude in terms of units of measure. So if, we, if our data is like this, instead of standardizing the data and then doing the PCA, we can do the PCA with the correlation matrix. Let's say another situation is that we are actually interested in that specific difference. Let's say we're trying to have our PCA capture the most important variable then we might want to use the covariance matrix because we want to build the model on the most important variables. Let's say we have more, that magnitude is important to us. So for example, if we're talking about populations of countries, if we were talking about issues within every country, you might want to standardize the population and do the PCA with the correlation matrix. But if we were doing some comparisons, and we want to take that difference in population into account, we might take the covariance matrix to do the PCA on. Now, the other idea that you have to understand in real life, what we are trying to do is to deduce the dimensions, if you remember. So if I use all the PCs, all the principal components, I'm not doing any dimension reduction. So I have to choose a Q, a number of uh, PCs that is less than the number of original uh, covariates and we have some methods to do this. The first method is deciding on a proportion of variation that I want to keep. So let's say uh, I have millions of observations on thousands of covariates and I want to achieve some reduction in the uh, data and 80% is good enough for me, 80% in terms of the information retainment. So I can decide on that percentage and we will see how many PCs I, can, I should keep to do this. There is something called the Cattell's method. The Cattell's method is basically about plotting the variance of every principal component, because as we mentioned, the variance is information, and kind of catch, uh, kind of taking the PCs until the uh, variance plateaus. So if I have uh, the first PC capturing 80, the second PC capturing, uh, let's say 10, the third PC capturing uh, one, the fourth capturing 0 0.7, and then they're kind of plateauing, I might capture the first two or the first three, depending on how much information I want to retain and what do I see as uh, relevant to, my, to solving my problem. The Kaiser method is another uh, third way. It's about the, uh, the, the eigenvalue. So I will keep the PCs with eigenvalue, and eigenvalue here is the uh, proportional to the variance of every PC. So I want to capture the ones that are above average. And by doing this, I will take kind of most of the variance and uh, leave a certain amount that is below average. So we have three different methods. Once you play around with them, you will understand them more. But this is the basic idea, capturing a specific proportion of variation. So I will say I'm good enough with retaining 80% of my information or 90%. I can do the Cattell's method, which tells me that after this value, adding more PCs will only increase the information very slightly, so it's not worth it to keep this data. The Kaiser's method tells me that these are the ones that are providing more information than the average. So maybe it's just good enough to keep these PCs and leave the other. When can we apply PCA? So pay attention to this because uh, you might be in situations where you're intrigued to use it on discrete data, but you should not. PCA should be done only on continuous data. Uh, it cannot be done on discrete data. Uh, you can probably look into some other dimensionality reduction uh, techniques to do, the, to do so, such as regular regression or something else. It's very useful when the original variables are highly correlated. Now imagine if our prop, if our data was already kind of uncorrelated, we had axes that were not correlated, we cannot achieve any PCA transformation. 
because the PCA transformation main idea is that it tries to make two uncorrelated axes. So if our two original axes were uncorrelated, it will just return them the same. It will tell us that these were uncorrelated already. So it's only useful when the data is highly correlated. So it's a really good idea to check the correlation matrix of the original data and see if some variables are highly correlated, say, let's say, uh, above 0.5 or above 0.6, some of the variables are, uh, have a high correlation. The correlation is between min minus one and one. It can be on the negative side. But basically, if I have more correlation, I can think that I will be able to achieve a lot of reduction using PCA. But PCA is severely distorted by outliers. So if I have points that are kind of outside the range of the original set, they will majorly affect the covariance and correlation matrix, and hence they will affect their principal components. And I might get com principal components that are very skewed or biased towards these outliers, which, do, which don't really represent my data. So it's very important to look at the data first and remove any outliers, then do uh, principal component. And I might also think about scaling my data before doing so, or using the correlation matrix so it's not affected by a single the uh, covariant in my uh, data set. Now let's look at some of these lovely uh, fish. So it's a manually solved example. So we will solve it by manually. What I mean is that we will aim to uh, break it step by step. And we might do the calculation with R, just because uh, it's not a uh, linear uh, algebra uh, kind of discussion. But we will uh, explain what's going on exactly in every step. So let's say um, I have a bunch of uh, uh, statisticians that are interested in separating two uh, species of the lovely tetrafish. So we know the tetrafish is kind of uh, very small. It's like a, an aquarium fish. Uh, the one on the right is called, I think, the uh, neon tetrafish, and the one on the bottom left is called the uh, black neon tetrafish. So let's say we're having our uh, team collect three different uh, measurements for every fish and putting them in a large matrix, and then we we'll, need to do some classification by certain things, or we want to do some clustering to understand how these species differ, or any kind of thing we're doing. If you don't like fish, Think about these, this data as anything else. So let's say x1, we're capturing the length from the tip of the mouth to the center of the uh, tail. Let's say x2 is capturing the vertical length from the top of the uh, top fin to the bottom of the bottom fin. And let's say x3 is capturing kind of parameter of the uh, fish uh, kind of waist, basically. So let's say we have data from three uh, tetrafish and we want to see if we need to capture all this information or is there a way to kind of reduce the dimensions of every data. So if we would visualize the data here, so I created this uh, plot uh, with plot line in R. I will show you a code. So this is our th uh, three, these are our three uh, uh, observations on three axes so we can look at the X the Y and the Z and as you notice uh, maybe the 3d is not the most intuitive so we want to see if there's an opportunity to look at the data in two dimensions instead of three dimensions so now what we're gonna do is a four step uh, methodology to find the principal component uh, kind of uh, decomposition of the data. Uh, maybe you want to take a screenshot of this, it's going to help you in solving problems that might come up in an exam or the, to just help you think about it. So remember, the first idea was variance equals information. So what do we want to do? We want to get the covariance matrix of our original variables. So this is step one. We're going to calculate the covariance of the original data. Step two, remember, we want to capture this variability in an orthogonal way or in an uncorrelated way. So we want to get the eigenvalues of these covariant of this covariance matrix. This will help us get uncorrelated directions of that variability. 
Step three, we want to calculate the eigenvectors. So the eigenvectors are going to give us kind of the directions of these new axes. So basically, they're going to be the new linear combinations of the observation points. So instead of having, uh, let's say, alpha by x1 plus beta by x2, we're going to create some new combinations that are going to spread our data in new axes. Step four is to calculate the scores matrix. The scores means basically we're mapping our original observations to the new axes. By this, we are done with principal component. A fourth step, variances information, capture the variability orthogonally, find the new directions or linear combinations, map the observations back to these new axes. So now the first step. The calculation of the covariance matrix of the data. Remember, the covariance matrix looks like this for 3 by 3. So it has a diagonal that captures the variance of every variable. And it has other entries that are the covariance of the row by the column. So if you think about variance x1, it's actually covariance x1, comma x1. But because it's the covariance of the variable with itself, it's going to be the variance itself. So this is actually the same as all of these, except it has x1 and x1, and it's going to translate to the variance. And notice that the covariance matrix is symmetric. So a covariance of x1, x2 is the same as covariance of x2, x1. Covariance of x1, x3 is the same as covariance of x1, x3. And the way we calculate the variance for these diagonal entries is getting every uh, vector of that specific variable and uh, taking this kind of calculation for it to understand how much is it spreading out of the uh, mean of that variable. And the covariance is the same thing, except that we are taking two uh, variables uh, against each other, or kind of like we're measuring the change within every variable and the other. Covariance and correlation, think about it this way to remember them. Co is like both of them. And variance is change. So how are these two changing with each other? If the covariance or the correlation is negative, it means that if one is increasing, the other is decreasing. If the covariance is very small, it means that a high increase in one is the only going to cause a small increase in the other, and so on. So it's how are they changing with each other? This is covariance. Now to do this, we're going to go uh, step by step, uh, and we'll use R as our calculator. So uh, to do this, we will solve it manually. The first step is to actually enter the observations into a matrix. So now we have our data matrix looking like this. If you're, so now every observation, every fish has these three measurements. Now calculating the matrix manually. So if I decided, as if you remember, we mentioned uh, calculating the variance to call diagonal entries. Uh, if you do the variance of the observation, this is not right, because the variance of observation is taking the variance of the observation over the three variable. This is a common mistake. So what you need to do is take the observation of each variable. So instead of taking the row, you have to take the variance of the column. This is x1, this is x2, this is x3. So here we're taking, calculating the variance. Now the covariance of between the first variable and the second variable, the first variable and the third variable, and the second variable and the third variable. All right, so now we're aggregating this to build our matrix that we have seen, and this is how the matrix is gonna look like. To check your answer, or to do it manual, uh, to do it automatically with R, you can just uh, put cov x, covariance of x. And, uh, Let's just check, and it gives us the exact same answer. So first we showed how to do the, each entry manually, and then we showed that it gives us the same answer as uh, our calculation. So this is our covariance matrix. Now step two, we want to get the eigenvalues of this covariance matrix. As we mentioned, the eigenvalues will tell us the directions of uh, orthogonality uh, of change. So it will give us in what change is the data changing independently. So the calculating the eigenvalues is about solving a bunch of uh, linear equations. You can look up a lot of good videos on these. So basically what you're trying to do is uh, the covariance matrix times 
a certain scalar would equal uh, the eigenvector times a certain scalar. And then you try to solve for different possible eigenvalues and you come up with a list. Luckily, R would do this to us, or you would do this for us in a single command, which is eigen. So if I do eigen of covariance matrix, and then it's going to return an eigen decomposition uh, object. If I take the values of that object, it's going to give me my uh, lambdas, which are the eigenvalues. Uh, one most important thing here is that, remember, we're trying to have PC1 capture most variability, PC2 capture the second most, PC3 captures the third most. So we have to rank our uh, eigenvalues once we get them, from the biggest one to the smallest one. Uh, so doing this will tell us that the first eigenvector has the most variability, the second eigenvector has the second most variability. If we don't do this, then uh, we will not have a specific way to identify which ones capture most variability. And when we solve for the eigenvalues, we might just be interested in solving for the eigenvalues. They won't be kind of sorted. We might uh, solve the linear equation a different way and find that uh, zero is a solution. I call that uh, lambda one. So after we do this, we have to rank them from the maximum to the minimum. Now our third step is to calculate the eigenvectors, which are the new kind of axes that will give us the, uh, the directions of the most variation. So if we do this, again, that uh, object in, in R, if I just do EV dollar sign vectors, it will give me the eigenvectors of the uh, covariance matrix and these uh, basically these are the eigenvectors now the eigenvectors in a lot of literature are called the PCs so PC1 refers to the eigenvector PC2 refers to the second eigenvector PC3 refers to the third eigenvector of the loading matrix some uh, other literature calls it PC loading of first principal component to be more specific not to confuse them with the score, which we will see now. So anyways, what you need to understand is that once you calculated the eigenvectors, you know the directions where the data should be spreading. So the first direction is the linear combination of the first two, the second direction is the linear combination of the second two, the third direction is uh, basically the third covariance. Okay, so the, third, the fourth step is to map the original observations to these new axes. So this is very simple. It's just about multiplying a dot product of the original data with this loading matrix. So once I do this in linear algebra, once I do a dot product between two variables, it's going to kind of transform these variables into these new directions to give us the uh, scores of the new observations. And this is exactly what it's called. It's called the scores matrix of the principal component. So PC1 scores, these are PC1 scores, these are PC2 scores, these are PC3 scores. So imagine uh, PC1 scores is basically the values of the X, kind of like the values of the X1 variable, X1 star. The PC2 scores is the value of the X2 star. The PC3 scores is the value of the X3 star of our observations, which are in every row. So now the first observation should be mapped to this point. The third and second observation should be mapped to this point. The third observation should be mapped to this point. And this is done in R very simply through this dot product operation. Imagine if you do regular multiplication, it will multiply element by element. But by doing this, it will do a dot product. So if I multiply my original data with this uh, eigenvectors, or the PC loadings, as uh, it's called, basically I'm going to get this matrix of uh, scores. So what <laughs> you might be thinking, we just went through a lot of linear algebra, a lot of calculation, you might be asking yourself, so what, uh, why are we doing all of this? Now let's recap on the benefits that we kind of, uh, captured from doing all of this. The first benefit is that we reduce the whole dimension of the data without losing any information. So this is not always the case, by the way, but because our third uh, eigenvalue was zero, we were so lucky that our the reduction in data told us that I can take out completely one dimension and still capture 100% of the information. 
And actually, it told us that we can retain 86% of the information by using a single PC. So I can just decide to use one dimension for my data and still capture 86%. And we will see why in a second. Another benefit, maybe we don't, we're not interested in reducing the dimensions, but we are just interested in doing linear regression. If you're familiar with linear regression, you should check out the video for linear regression. Multicollinearity is an issue. It violates the assumptions that we have in a, uh, in a linear regression model. So once we do PC regression, it's much more robust and it's much, it has, uh, it satisfies the assumptions very well. So we can do much more uh, credible inference from our model. So now the PCs are completely uncorrelated. We can just do a regression uh, tra treating the first uh, PC uh, scores as the first variable and the second PC scores as the second variable and do a regression between these two. And we can easily transform back to the original data from that uh, new dimension. And the most important benefit is that now we can capture our data or plot them in 2D. Instead of uh, before, you've seen the 3D plot and it's very confusing to look at. Imagine if you had thousands of points, you cannot even plot them. Imagine if I told you that I can retain 90% uh, of the information with two PCs. And now you're so interested to look at the data in two dimensions to see if there are outlying observations, if there are observations that you should get rid of. It will give you a lot of good exploration of the data. So these are the main three benefits that we capture from uh, principal component analysis. Now let's look at our data in these new uh, PC dimensions. So if you remember, our scores matrix is Z. So if I take the first uh, variable as the first column of Z, and this is the first PC, PC1, and this is PC2, my data is going to look like this, much more neat uh, than the original data. And if you notice, the variation between uh, the variation on the second principal component is very low. So I might just decide to get rid of it. So if I want to retain 100% of the variability, I can just report this data to any data analyst and he would be able to do the same analytics on it that if I gave them that 3D data. The second thing, I can just move to one dimension and still capture 86% of the variability. And that might be good enough to make a classification on the type of fish, for example. So if I move to a single uh, dimension, and that's just a line, I will have my data distributed this way. And somehow, some way, maybe I will find a separating point between the black neon and the neon tetra fish. And I can do any analytics on it by retaining 86% of the variability. So this is huge that I can retain 86% with a single component. So that's a reduction of uh, 66 point whatever percent of my original data, and I still capture that much of my data. Now, uh, let's talk about the proportion of variation that you can retain. So the proportion of variation that you can retain from the PCs, because remember, we don't want to keep all the PCs. The idea of dimension reduction is that we want to reduce the amount of data. So what we can, uh, how to calculate it, because the eigenvalues are proportional to the variance of these new PCs, you just sum the eigenvalues of the PCs you want to retain and divide them by the sum of all. So the sum of all the eigenvalues is basically all the variance in your data. So if I want to keep two, I will take the first uh, two eigenvalues and divide them the, by the total. And that's going to work out to be 100% because our lambda 3 was uh, uh, zero because we were so lucky that a whole dimension uh, could have been neglected. If I want to keep lambda 1 only, this is going to take us to 86%, which is still a very valuable amount of data. Now to the last part of the, the video. Hope you're enjoying it so far. Basically, we're going to talk about how to implement the method in R. So the uh, basic R has the methods. We don't need any packages or libraries to do so. Uh, so the, uh, there are two, actually, uh, PCA. Uh, the one I like is PrintComp. It's very simple. So you would give it the matrix itself of the covariates, and you, it usually has a default uh, argument, correlation true, which means it's using the correlation matrix. As we mentioned, the correlation matrix is equivalent to standardizing the data. 
if the data had high variance or they were measured in different scales, we might want to have it done with the correlation matrix. If not, we will just say core equal false or error. The PrintCom object will give us a standard deviation of the components, which is the square root of the variance of the eigenvalues, uh, or actually the square root of the eigenvalues. It, the loadings will give us the loadings matrix, which we have seen. So the loading, you might still be, I remember when I first uh, was introduced to this topic, the loadings and the scores are were always confusing. Think about the loadings are the eigenvectors of the matrix, which are the direction. So the loading is the axis. The scores is the mapping of the observations to the new axis. So the scores is the actual values for every observation. The loading is just our direction of the kind of the linear combination that we're going to uh, do to reflect our data on these new axes. The summary object gives you the standard deviation, the proportion of variation, the cumulative proportion of variation. We're going to look at this in a second. And you can plot the print comp object, and we will see the plot. And you can do something called a by plot, which we will discuss shortly. And finally, you can predict how a new observation will be reflected in this uh, new PC. It's not much of a prediction, even though it uses the predict function. It's really just a mapping of the new observation to the new data. Let's go back to our RStudio. So uh, now if we solve that same example with R. So as I mentioned, if I fit my PCA, or I basically do my PCA uh, decomposition, I will just do print com. I will give it the first argument as the data matrix. And I will say correlation equal false because we use the covariance matrix. Now I have a PCA object. If I take the summary of that object, it tells me that the uh, components are three. Basically, they're always going to be the same number as your original covariance. But what you do is to decide how much uh, proportion of variation you want to maintain. And the last row here tells you the cumulative proportion. So if I keep the first two, I'm taking all my 100% of information. If I keep the first one, I'm getting 86% and so on. Now the loadings, which are the new directions, basically this is my loadings matrix. And if you remember, we got the same loadings matrix. It's going to give us the same direction. The scores matrix is going to give me the uh, mapping of the new observations. You might notice that it's a little bit different than what we got, but uh, the scores matrix uh, is just a translation of uh, dimension to another dimension, and uh, this is a scaled one. So basically, they are centering it around zero. So every variable is uh, so component one is being uh, scaled to zero, component two is being uh, scaled or centered around zero, and component three, if you remember, it was two, two, two. It's just uh, subtracting the average and you can do this very comfortably because it's a mathematical transformation so we're just uh, taking it from a certain kind of distribution and centering it around zero we are still keeping the most important thing which is the same variance in our data now if i plot the pca the first plot gives me uh, a plot that will help me uh, implement the Kittel's method so uh, it will give me the variance of each component. And if you remember, we said once it plateaus, I can decide to keep uh, this many principal components. So you can argue that you are using Cattell's method would take the first one only because they kind of plateau after the second one. It's really a subjective choice. The by plot is a very important plot and it's usually covered as a standalone topic in data mining and machine learning uh, courses. So basically, the by plot is a way to imagine two things, envision actually two things in the same time, the scores of the old observations into the new observation. And these are the bottom axis and the left axis, which is like uh, uh, a normal uh, kind of uh, 2D plot that we see, two axes. And these, this is related to the observations. And you can see the tick marks in R are giving in black. So the observations are in black. So they are related to these two axes. The second thing is the loadings uh, axis, which is the top axis and the uh, right axis. And these are related to the original variables. So what this is telling me is that the original variables are related 
to the new principal components in this way. So the length of the arrow is telling me the proportion of variation of that variable to the uh, principal component. So for example, this variable, which is variable one, is uh, highly proportional on the first principal component. The second variable, the variable two is highly proportional on the uh, second principal component because this is the second and this is the first. It's always uh, the mirror image or kind of uh, the one across. So if the bottom is comp one, the top is comp two. If the left is comp two, the right is comp two. So if I just drop like a projection here, I can know that variable two is negative on component two. Variable one is positive variation on component one. What about variable three? Here it tells me that variable 3 is very negligible. It's uh, 0 and 0 on the first two principal components. And now if you remember our data, we had 2, 2, 2 for the observations on the third vector, which told us that really we can neglect it. It's a repetitive piece of information. Knowing a single value would have been enough to know all the others. So it's telling me that the variable 3 is uh, unimportant in my principal component uh, uh, transformation. So now uh, the uh, kind of the uh, cosine of this angle is telling me the correlation between variable 1 and variable 2 and the length of the arrow is telling me the proportion of variation on every uh, principal component and this is really what you need to understand. You can go as far as if I take a uh, orthogonal projection of each observation on the direction of that variable or uh, it will return me back to the original axis as well but this is what you need to know loadings on the top and the right scores on the left and the bottom scores are related to the observations loadings are related to the original variables so now uh, just one last thing how to interpret the re relationship you can say that principal component one is almost fully related to variable one and principal component 2 is almost fully related to variable 2 on a negative direction. If you had like a bunch of other variables, uh, one principal component could be the average of a couple that are being in a different direction, or it could be the sum of a three that are in one direction. So this is just kind of a way to understand what do our new uh, directions mean. Going back to R. Now, if I want to uh, get a PC score for a new observation, let's say I had a fourth fish, and I want this fourth fish, which had a variable, uh, original variable 2.3, 2.5, 2.1, I want to see where it will look in our uh, plot. So this is the new scores. Very easily, you can just predict, put our original transformation model, and put the new observation. It will give me the transformation. Of the values in every principal component. If you are interested also in the 3D plot, this is the uh, command to do it. Basically, you use the plot li library and you specify the three points and you tell it it's a scatter 3D. With this, we end this topic. Please let us know if you liked it and uh, if you like to see more videos like this, please subscribe and like this video to see what's coming next. Thank you so much for listening and good luck.